So let me read this out to you. I'm loving this podcast. It's like sitting in a bath of warm water in that the subject matter is gently flowing over you in a warm, friendly, soothing way. When I get to the end of the series, I'm going to start again. <laughs> I think Sarah sent it to me, so I'm assuming it's on iTunes. So uh, thank you to Skinny Latter <laughs> via Apple Podcasts. Yes, it is. It's Apple Podcast who left that review. It made me laugh. I've never, ever, I don't think, been compared <laughs> to a bath of warm water. But hey, it certainly, it certainly made me smile. And I will take a review worded like that. Poetry in its finest, in its finest watery form. I'm Paul, and this is the Mastering Portrait Photography Podcast. Well, I blew that ambition out the water didn't i the let's do one podcast every week for the rest of the year uh i've barely managed three or four i think it has been just one of those years this is episode 154 and really it's just been busy as i record this it's the 4th of july so happy 4th of july to all of our american listeners in so many ways the 4th of july might be something of an independence day for us too certainly with a little luck, a day of change. Um, it's just been really busy. In a, in a year like this, everything's working really well, but we're having to work that little bit harder to get there. Everything's a little bit more expensive. Clients have a little less to spend. And somebody wrote in the other day and said that they were waiting for episode 154. And partly because having the podcast, this podcast out there, from someone who is living and breathing the same industry that you are, feeling the same things that you are going through the same processes the same client experiences that you are is comforting and just knowing that they're not alone so here is episode 154 in that sense i think we really are um, a market we're a collective of individuals we're all going through the same thing but on our own <laughs> so it's useful to know uh, that there's other people out there going through the same thing so I don't sleep very much. Uh, we're working flat out. I love every second of it. Don't get me wrong. Having having a camera in my hands is just the most natural thing in the world. So in taking pictures for a living, well, I couldn't ask for a better way to put food on the table. But that's not to say it isn't really hard work. And then fitting in all of the other things that seem to have crept up into my world well, it just takes a little bit of time. So apologies that the podcast has been a little bit more sporadic than I would have liked. Uh, before I get any further, I would just like to say thank you to everybody that filled in the questionnaire that Sarah has sent out. Um, it's really, really, really interesting. The data in it is incredibly insightful. And what we're trying to understand is... What do we do with mastering portrait photography? How do I push it and prod it and coax it forwards? Um, we're due to give it a really big kick this year. That's what we're trying to do. But at this stage, we weren't entirely certain where to focus. So we now have an awful lot of really insightful, useful data. And the biggest thing that's come up is that it's well worth doing. <laughs> I know that sounds really bizarre, you know, I know people read our articles. I know people like the diagrams. Our stuff is out there in Professional Photo Magazine and this month also in Digital Photography Magazine if you want to pick up a copy of that on the newsstand. I know uh, Professional Photo uh, has gone all digital, but a digital photographer. So, <laughs> is there a paradox there that Professional Photo Magazine is now all digital, but Digital Photography Magazine, you can pick that up on a newsstand? I can't. I think there must be a paradox in there somewhere or an irony. Maybe it's an irony. I never entirely certain know the difference between an irony and a paradox. Anyway, anyway, um, thank you to everybody who filled that in. Uh, I was due to record this podcast. This podcast was meant to be was meant to be a podcast from the Land Rover, uh, but it's been a very hot day. I was working uh, a two hour drive away. So a two hour drive, half hour shoot, two hour drive back. And I was going to record one, maybe two podcasts. Um, weirdly, the Land Rover was more rattly than, us than usual because, and I don't know why, there is a toaster in the footwell. You know when you get into a car and you, you, you drive away and you can hear the clanking, <laughs> rattling, there's a little chrome toaster in my footwell. I need to pick that up with my son. 
Uh, anyway, on the topic of kids, both my kids, I, I know it, it's got nothing to do with photography, right? But I'm a dad and you can't help but be proud of your children. And this couple of weeks, I, I'm beyond proud. Uh, today, Jake got his degree, uh, sport technology from Loughborough University. So he got a 2-1 uh, degree in BNG in it's literally engineering with balls there's no other way to describe it that's what it is they study balls <laughs> and things with which to hit balls cricket bats baseball bats golf clubs football boots uh, they also uh, research things like uh, helmets so when a ball hits you it stops you being an unconscious cricket player or <laughs> backstop or whatever uh, so truly truly a magnificent result for him really really proud of him and just as proud of our daughter, who has, for the past few weeks, just started her new job working in London for one of the biggest creative agencies, creative marketing agencies in the UK um, as a creative account manager. Uh, she's just going to tear the world apart. She's super organised, super creative, super lovely to work with. She's a grafter. Um, and I could not be prouder of both of them. So forgive me for saying that and giving a shout out to my own children. But hey, it's my podcast. You don't have to listen to it. Uh, so where are we? Wait, it has been a very busy, uh, I think it's about six weeks since I've done an episode. Um, so I, I cannot, I've lost count. I Usually I give you a quick count up of everything we've done. Numerous hearing dog shoots, a load of workshops and one-on-one -on -one masterclasses. Then I just... Do you know what? I never thought, I honestly never thought I'd enjoy running workshops and masterclasses as much as I do. And there's something, and, and I don't know why, but there's something really thrilling about being in a room with a few people who genuinely want to uh, take ideas and create ideas and push boundaries and try things and discuss things. Um, and that's turning into actually a really really for me a really rewarding part of our business and I never I don't know if I ever really expected that it's I'm certainly not one of those people that was oh do you know what I really love doing training because it's giving something back it's none of that it's not that at all there's just an incredible buzz of a group of people working towards creating an image and explaining and understanding and learning how things work and why more importantly why we do things why it's always everyone tells you what you know, when you look at things online, everything's about the what and the how, but why? Why do we do things? Why do we approach light the way we do? Why do we approach the camera settings the way we do? Why, 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 why? I've, I just find the why so much more interesting than the what and the how. And I think probably more valuable because if I understand why, then I'll do it. If I understand the what, I won't necessarily do it. It might be a useful tool or it might be a useful technique. But if I don't really get why I'm doing something, I will bin that off as just not useful. But if I understand why, if there's a rationale to why. And so all of our workshops and masterclasses now are premised on why. Anyway, that's a slight aside. But we, last week, we had a couple of students, work placement students, had a 15-year-old and a 17-year-old, two uh, brilliant uh, young students who had approached us to come and spend uh, a few days with us in the studio uh, they came with us to the hearing dogs for a shoot and then we did um, a shoot here uh, with um, a guy in military uniform um, it's one of those the shots are, this was the perfect shoot for me um, a guy said I want to do something really sort of vintage you, modern cameras modern lighting all the rest of it but he sent me a couple of pictures that must have been taken, I'm going to guess, in the 1940s. At, I don't know the exact date, but I'm guessing around there from the style. My grandfather, both my grandfathers had pictures like these in their military uniform. There's something about the way it's lit, something about the way it's styled, something about the way it's posed and finished. And of course, it's on film, black and white film. And he said, I want to recreate these, but in, you know, he's a, he's a soldier, he's at the very top of what you can be if you're a non-commissioned officer um, and he wanted to celebrate that moment and so we photographed these incredible images and there was a moment in the shoot where literally the hair stood up, stood up on the back of my neck and I realised what I was looking at were the same pictures that I would have seen of my grandfather's the same styling, the same vibe, the same feel and it's a sort of, it's an almost indescribable styling that makes all of that hang together anyway it was absolutely wonderful and i would love to share them 
but I can't because he works for one of the top secret um, units in the military. So while I've got these beautiful pictures, it's of a guy that I can never tell you about, never show him pictures. I can tell you I did the shoot because it's, of course, <laughs> nobody knows. Uh, but it's a real shame. But I really, really, really enjoyed it. So I'm now looking around for anyone with a, a military uniform of a similar style that uh, we could do something we could do something with that I can share. So if there's any of you out there who have uh, retired from the military but still have your number two uniform, I'd love to to uh love to take some pictures <laughs> just for the sheer joy of doing exactly the same thing but then i can share them uh i think the students really enjoyed it too and then the day after that uh a brilliant magician i've worked with sam strange for probably for 12 years i think now um incredible magician part of the champions of magic him uh young and strange he works as part of a duo with richard young uh, but this was a shoot just for him sam strange wonderful guy just a, a like I'm so lucky in this studio that the human beings that come in here are, I think, some of the nicest people in the world. I mean, I have only met a tiny proportion of the people in the world. I'm sure there are other nice people, but my client base is genuinely a, a, just a, a never-ending stream of people who I love to spend time with. And Sam Strange is right up there. So we spent ages taking some pictures of him, and as as a kind of, we wanted to get some shots where he was genu genuinely performing. So the two work placement students became instantaneously his audience. Uh, some card tricks. He did these card tricks. One of the students looked quite confused. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not entirely certain that she understood what had just happened while she was holding the card with her name on it and a knife hole in it. But anyway, it was very funny and absolutely uh, wonderful. We've done a load of portrait shoots. The weather has been kind for a couple of weeks, which is uh, a pleasure. Uh, so we've been out in the sunshine. Um, and, and just, it's just, it's what I came into photography to do was to laugh in the sunshine, taking beautiful pictures. Uh, so that's really, really, really lovely. Um, We've been judging the monthlies, the BIPP, the BIPP, the British Institute of Professional Photography uh, monthlies over the past couple of months. Uh, I think we've done two monthlies since I last spoke with you. Sorry, that's my bad. Just busy. That's all it is. We're just busy. Um, I love doing. I love chairing the judging. And then on top of that, um, I was asked to chair the print judging for the Click Expo that was up in the Midlands a couple of weeks ago. Some big names there, Lindsay Adler and a few others uh, with some of the photographers presenting. It was... Um, it wasn't the biggest expo in the world, but we had a really good entry into the, the print competition and the standard was out of this world. And when you see a panel of judges, we had judges on rotation, so five judges at any one time and me chairing it. And when you see the excitement, you see the judges' eyes just light up when they are appreciating the very best of the craft of photography. I think... You know, there's. I don't know how to explain some of this stuff. Why that? You know that feeling when you take a picture, right? And you hit the button and you just know. You just know. You can feel it. That's the same sensation that I think we still get when we're assessing images at the highest standard. There's something really exhilarating about it. Inexplicable, uh, but exhilarating. Actually, on the flip side of that, I was laughing with our two work placement students of the other side of the line, which is when you see somebody else take a beautiful photo in there in the same session as you. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm training people, this happens to me. And, you know, we're talking through staff, we're doing ideas, and then somebody hit the button and they'll create a picture that I wish I'd taken. And then I have to suppress, <laughs> I have to suppress that kind of, oh, I'm really jealous about that. Why didn't I take that picture? I Because I, you can't, of course, you have to celebrate the the absolute the excitement i still get the same excitement from the picture i just wish i'd taken it um which is quite a weird sensation i'm getting used to that sensation because if i'm doing my job well in a workshop if i'm doing my job well in a master class if i'm genuinely um passing on ideas and information then really people in those workshops should be creating beautiful images that i'm jealous of it is still quite hard though anyway we were judging at click um, and I'm going to come back uh, to to that in a moment as the topic of this particular podcast. Uh, but a few bits and pieces. Uh, one of the things that occurred to me this morning, and I'm going to drop this into this podcast only because it's a useful thing to remember, um, is always remember to pack your bag so that at a single glance, you know what's in it. 
and well, more importantly, what isn't. <laughs> I was driving along, and I do this thing. If you, if, I don't know if you're the same as me. I'll get halfway down the road, and I'll be like, did I pack my passport? And I literally, I don't know how many times I've done it. I've pulled into a lay-by and gone and checked. I still do the same with my camera kit. But this morning I was driving away and I did that thing. Have I packed everything I need? And then actually I remembered I'd looked over the top of my bag um, while it was open and I know everything was there because I pack it in a way that if something is missing, I can see the gap. And it's like, oh, okay. So um, you could do it with checklists, of course. You can be much more methodical than that. But just as a simple trick, pack your bag in a way where you can visibly see if something is missing. Right, so where are we in our warm bath of water? <laughs> I still think that's a great review. Thank you, Skinny Latte. That's just like, the Skinny Latte is their username, by the way. That's just, not just me being random. Uh, that is like the best review. I'm going to put that on, uh, if I ever have a poster, you know, Paul Wilkinson appearing somewhere. It's like sitting in a bath of warm water. <laughs> I don't know what to do with it. But it's my, uh, please feel free, everybody, to write us poetic reviews like this. And I promise you they will get read out because it's absolute genius. Um, I, I just love that. I'm going to have that printed as a poster. I'm loving this podcast. It's like sitting in a bath of warm water. <laughs> anyway, um, I thought I do these regularly. Um, quick updates on things that I heard or saw during um, the judging. Um, so let me just go over stuff. Incidentally, as an aside, one of the reasons we use... Sorry, there's lots of asides with me. You get used to that or you don't. That was funny the night. I met someone for the first time and she laughed at me and said, you're always after the punchline, aren't you? And I was like, yeah. That was really... It was very astute, but it did somewhat stop me in my tracks. Um, I don't mean to be like that. I just am. Uh, one of the reasons we use a panel of judges or more than one judge is so that we get a more reliable score. But I was judging in the monthlies this month round, and I won't, say, I won't say who the judge was, but they were very worried that their score was out of kilter with the other judge. And they had no reason to be. I, I can export the judge's scores and I can see exactly what's going on. I'm, I'm a big data nut. I love data. I love the data behind scoring. So I've had a look at the data and their scoring is exactly where I would hope it would be. But you don't always agree. And that's really important. If every judge for every image gave the same score, we'd only ever need one judge. That's not how it works. That is so not how it works. It's not supposed to work like that. A panel of judges are all supposed to bring different experiences different backgrounds, different hotspots that they look for, different passions, different prejudices, different biases. By using a panel of judges, you will always get a different score or you should always get a different score from every judge or you haven't picked your panel of judges very well. And we pick our panels of judges incredibly carefully so that they are different. They bring different ideas to the table. We pick the panel of judges so that they're going to get on. They're going to work as a team. So if there's a challenge, if there's a discussion, they're not going to get into an argument. They're going to develop a, a thought process and come to a considered view. That's why we use a panel of judges. It's important that the judges are reliable and they are experienced and they're top of their game, of course, but they will give different scores. Anyway, in the, from uh, Click this time and a little bit from the monthlies, I thought I'd very quickly go through one or two things I heard. It's just useful stuff. You know, there's nothing major in that. Um, so paper choice. Paper choice comes up in every single print competition I am involved in. It just does. Um, the big one this time was be careful where um, if you've got a textured paper and you print something like a baby on it with smooth skin, it can look like the baby's skin is wrinkled, particularly when um, the baby or the face of the baby is quite small in the frame. Newborns, this was typically a criticism. Watch your paper choice. If you're going to print things that would have a smooth texture in the real world, smooth skin, that kind of thing, use a smooth paper. Uh, that said, if you're using fine art matte papers, go and figure out how to get your blacks to map correctly because typically fine art matte papers don't give you much uh, change between the grades of black. It suddenly goes, it goes sort of dark. So you get blocked up areas that aren't quite black. And then suddenly when you get to a slightly lighter, like a lighter tone, you'll start to see texture again. 
There are ways of printing for that. Go look them up. Uh, Sanjay Jogi, I'm going to give Sanjay a quick shout. He's a brilliant printer, brilliant technician. Uh, he does uh, workshops and seminars on printing. You can do a lot worse than go talk to Sanjay. And he's a super lovely guy. Two, uh, Stray Hairs, we had one. Actually, this was in a digital file um, in the competition uh, this month. There's a Stray Hair in the print, in the file, and that's clearly on the sensor. With print and competition judging, the judges are going to zoom these things in. They're going to look at them on a light box if it's a print. They're going to zoom it to 100% on a big ISO monitor if it's a digital competition. If there's a stray hair or a dust spot, they are going to see it. So go find your files. Go go over them and over them and over them. If you want to do well in competitions, get the little details right uh, because that scored, that dropped, I mean, so many points. It was a great image, great idea, creatively brilliant. But if you're letting things like dust spots and stray hairs go through, that's not going to be regarded as competition standard. Mounts. We saw some incredible mounts. We saw circular mounts and oval mounts and... Uh, one photograph, I've seen, I don't know if it's the same author, but I've seen this technique a couple of times where they cut out the edges of the mount so the landscape picture goes all the way across and breaks out the sides of the frame. Um, they're brilliant. Um, you remember that with a print competition, typically the mount is part of the puzzle. So make sure your mounts are complementary. Make sure they are adding to the image. They're not distracting from the image. Um, make sure that your everything is super accurate, super just square it needs to be lined up where it needs to be we had one uh, image where the horizon wasn't horizontal uh it was a seascape and it wasn't horizontal and it may have slipped in the mount or it may be that the author just didn't notice i don't know which of those two things is true but of course it's not going to do that well so mounting is really really important and we do zoom in so make sure the quality um is there uh, a few did come up with banding issues jpeg issues in this day and age where computers are pretty powerful and you know the sensors and cameras are at least 14 bit these days um if not 16 um then please do just get your techniques down so if you've got a big blue sky make sure it's a big blue sky without banding in it um it's just one of those things uh titling bit of a i don't I, this comes up every single time i don't like titling i don't think it should be necessarily part of an image competition uh, but i'm out there as i'm in the minority i think um, but I just don't like it. I think we should judge what we see in front of us. But uh, if the competition asks for a title, enter one, create one, invent one, stick your image in an AI generator and get a title. I don't care how you do it, but put a title in. On average, now I've only heard this anecdotally and I've no idea what the research was, but anecdotally, a couple of judges told me, that titles typically give you one additional mark on average, if it's a sensible title. It certainly can add poetry to it. It can add a meaning to it. So if you put up a picture, I, I have no idea, uh, of a, a, a sad-looking child. I don't know. I'm making this up. A sad-looking child with no title. Well, it's a sad-looking child. Put up a sad-looking child and give it the title, Daddy's Gone Again. Suddenly, you've got a very different tone to how the viewers and the judges are assessing that image now this is why i don't agree with it because i don't think that's how it should work i think we should judge the image but given it's an opportunity to get a mark or two and given you're entering a competition which is a game then play the game put titles in uh where are we um a couple of images came this time around which i wrote down all details i'm reading this from my notebook uh where I, I carry a notebook almost all of the time it's a throwback to my phd days i think always had a notebook uh title uh sorry all details some so eg cushions this was a an image that came in where the whole the the, the room had been styled to perfection but when he looked at the sofa it looked like somebody had just sat on it so the cushions were fine like the back cushions, the throws and all of those, but the actual seated part of the sofa had been left as if somebody had just sat on it. Perhaps they sat on it to plump up the cushions. I don't know, <laughs> but it just, it drew our eye to it because everything else in the image was so pristine. Watch your details, particularly with architectural and commercial. Uh, confusion. This came up where we weren't certain or the judges weren't certain what to make of an image. I've talked about this a few times. It's not the judge's job to decode your story. It's your job as the author to tell your story in a way that the judges 
can get it. It's got to be approachable. Um, you can be as clever as you like. You can be as subtle as you like. But in the end, if you're not telling the story in a way that the judges can understand and decode it, that's not the judge's fault. Um, so just, you know, make sure, maybe test it on other people and see what they think of the image before submitting it. Uh, we saw a few of these. Uh, what have I written down? Uh, I've written down uh, the if only image. Yeah, okay. I wrote down if only. If only is one of those things. Have you ever done that with your images where you look at an image in Lightroom and you're just like, oh, if only. If only the background was cleaner. If only I hadn't blown a highlight. If only the eyes were sharp. You know what I mean? You have these if only moments where the image, you've done everything right, but then you missed a bit. Well, don't enter those into a competition for a start. Um, there was one image that came up and it felt to me like... It felt like a grab shot. It was a beautiful shot, but a grab shot. Now, the construction of the image was one we see all the time, dog in a basket. Nothing particularly clever about that, um, or, you know, rare in that, I suppose. But the particular angle, the way it was framed, felt like they'd grabbed the shot. Now, if you said to a fine oil artist or a pencil artist or a cartoonist or a commercial airbrusher, create me a picture of a dog in a basket they would have a real angle on it there'd be something about the way they place the objects relative to each other and relative to the frame there'd be a way of doing it that would have a certain aesthetic a style a cleanliness for me my particular thing is i love when the lens is absolutely horizontal low down in the frame preferably on the floor if it's some, a subject that is on the floor so that everything for me, I feel like it climbs into that world. That's just my particular aesthetic. It doesn't have to be anybody else's. I mean, please, <laughs> everybody, I'm a Muppet. I don't know what I'm on about, but I like the idea that I've done something that has a, it has a statement to it. It has a shape to it. I love the work of E.H. Shepard, who drew A.A. A. Milne's books, um, Winnie the Pooh and House at Pooh Corner and When We Were Young and all of these beautiful Christopher Robin stuff. The drawings always feel like you're in the small character's world. You're not an adult looking down at it. And I think that's the point I'm trying to make is have a view. Think about it. Think as if you're drawing it. Don't think of it as a photograph. Think, OK, take a step back if you've got time. Sometimes you don't, right? If you're a news photographer, you haven't got time. But step back from your image in your head. Say, OK, these are all of the bits of the puzzle. This is, I've got one of those, two of them, three of them. I've got these colours and this shape, this light. If I was drawing this, if I slowed down and somebody said, draw those on a piece of paper so that it made sense, how would I do it? And, you know, there's, an, there's another picture. It was a picture, um, it was a newborn picture, and there were objects in the foreground, so it, was, it made it feel like the baby was amongst objects. And then there were objects behind the baby, but what's happened is they've, thought that because we mutter a lot and i'll come on to this one later don't crop things at the edges of a frame they pulled the objects that baby was surrounded by away from the edge of the frame but that meant it felt like there was only a few objects in this instance using the objects and cutting them at the edge of the frame as if there was millions of them receding into the distance that would have made sense and visually it would have had an expansive feel to it rather than i only have four of those objects so i've placed them where i have and it's that sense of thinking about your layer. And if you look at the very best of these types of images, the guys really do know their way around it. Uh, comping, compositing, combining images, it must be invisible. We actually, as photographers, don't have a problem on the whole, unless the category says you can't use composite images. We don't have a problem with it. Judges don't worry about it. We just don't want to see it. So the compositing, the bringing different images and elements together has to be invisible. Uh, there are skills to this, practice them, because if the minute a judge spots that it's a composite, it's failed in its job. I mean, obviously there are obvious composites. You know, if, if you're doing a King Kong thing of a gorilla climbing a skyscraper, fair enough. We're going to know straight away that's not real. But it still has to look real. It has to be believable. Uh, okay, what else have we got? Um, baby skin. This has come up a few times. Um, be careful of using blue and dark green style filters, filter effects in your monochrome conversions. A blue filter typically turns the lips dark, which is fine if you have um, 
like you've got a model and smooth skin like ultra smooth skin and makeup that's flawless because if you've got red lipstick and you punch a monochrome with a bluish or green filter it drops the lips to a very dark color and that can look incredible but with babies what it also does is if there's any red in the cheeks it makes those go blotchy too so you have dark lips and bruised looking cheeks and that's not really how probably you want to have uh, a baby photograph by the way if you can hear stuff going on in the background i've got all the windows open because it's a really warm day um and i'm sitting just recording uh where are we uh on the converse side of that so we've got blue filters making skin look kind of uh, grungy and textured and blotchy equally we are still seeing way too much over smoothing um on the skin work um it just it doesn't look if it doesn't look quite right it, you know and it's really subtle i don't know how to describe it but we know as judges when we look at it, I, i'm a big one for when someone applies makeup to a face really well really beautifully it smooths out the lumps and bumps but what it doesn't do is remove the texture there's still pores there's still skin pores there's still fine hairs there are still little tiny ripples created by blemishes underneath the makeup so if you want to make it look real when you're doing digital makeup or digital smoothing you have to remember to leave details in that show reality even when you're doing really fine art kind of work so just watch that um incidentally a uh, shout again to evoto ai um i've just had a new release of that this week um incredible bit of software uh in that you can control how much you do of it <laughs> so it's not it's not all the bells and whistles that make these things good what make these things good is when you can turn it down so it's imperceptible uh evoto ai is actually very very good please do go and have a play with that uh, i will drop a link down in uh further down in the show notes over sharpening uh, this came up as a bit of a debate actually me and sanjay don't entirely agree on this i don't think my view is that you don't need to sharpen images anymore um i've never heard not once have i heard a judge say this image needed more sharpening not once i've heard images get critiqued because they're soft by which i mean they're blurred and the minute you try to rescue a blurred image using um topaz or you know any one of the sharpening tools unless you're really on top of it and really 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 careful it looks like it's sharpened however i've heard many times that an image looks over sharpened over over you see halos you see this kind of slightly really weird edge effect um i took the decision a couple of years ago to stop sharpening my images because it removes one or two problems when you because for us we don't uh we produce the same file to be printed at different sizes i don't worry too much um about uh scaling at 300 dpi for a4 300 dpi for a 7 by 5 300 dpi i just give the guys one file um and our sensors now are so sharp that they reproduce and they give a for me they give a slightly smoother finish um and I've only ever been pulled up on over sharpening when I did it. No one's ever pulled me up on under sharpening. So I would say don't sharpen. Sanjay doesn't say that. He says you should do sharpening, but know exactly at which point in the workflow to do it. Now that's fine. Um, Sanjay's a master at this stuff. So he does sharpen. Uh, I'm using Sanjay as an example because he's one of my judges uh, this time around. Uh, so it's an interesting thing. My, If you're not absolutely 100% certain of what sharpening to do, don't do any you'll be fine uh where are we um oh yeah one of the things um has come up this come up in conversation a little bit is why we as judges get so picky about which images get over the line to be a merit or a bronze so typically with all of the associations all slightly different but around about the 80 mark for most associations is the break point for bronze or merit now the thing about a bronze or a merit is that is something that's likely to end up being used on a website or being used in social media for the association. Um, maybe with the societies, it's going to end up on their display boards at the convention. And that's why we're picky. That break point between professional standard, as a lot of the associations call it, and a merit or a bronze, that break point defines what will be displayed to the public and to the rest of the photography industry and as such the message we're sending is that this image is what you should be trying to attain 
So when I go around, if I'm uh, if I've entered a competition, I go around and look at all of the things that have uh, they're being displayed in the convention or they're in the magazine or in a book. I look at those images from bronze to gold as the things I should be aiming for. And that's why as judges, we're very careful what goes over that line. And if we find a defect that we think, Do you know what, the photographer should have spotted that, you're going to dump marks really quickly because be the judges don't want to have that out there as something that becomes an exemplar for what a successful image should be. That's why. That's why that break point is so tough. Uh, so just watch it. <laughs> it was quite funny this uh, in the competition this time around. Uh, and the monthlies is... Uh, one of the images looked like the horizon wasn't quite level. It's a digital file, so it clearly wasn't anything to do with the mounting. And by the way, it was a degree or two out, which is, I don't know. I don't know why people do that. Why would you do that, given you just put it into Lightroom or Photoshop and align with the ruler tool? Anyway, by two judges, I'm watching both of them on uh, our Squadcast screen. So we record these sessions. Um, one of the judges went to his ITSO monitor took the file, put it into Photoshop and checked the horizontal alignment. My other judge went to a cupboard. I watched them do it, went to a cupboard behind them, opened the cupboard door, got a ruler out and started measuring her screen, which is quite weird when you're watching her on the webcam that's on her screen. <laughs> She's measuring the screen. It was quite old school, but it did make me laugh. Anyway, things like Horizons, check them. Uh, right, where else have we got? Oh yeah, when you're, there's a lot of, actions around and even I've written a few where you're going to soften or blur the edges um, so th there was a particular file where I think a baby's skin had been softened and you could see that it had been and it was fine it looked very good actually it looked like they got a good technique on it but what they hadn't done is lift all of the skin onto a new layer just cut it out and drag it onto a new layer and softened it there what they'd done is soften it on the original layer with all of the um, blankets and clothing around it and what that did is it dragged color from the blankets into the softened skin so you could see a slight coloration around the edges where the softening had been done and you expect that if you're using a blur it blurs across the boundary so what you have to do is cut out the skin onto a new layer so it's transparent all the way around except for the skin soften it there and then you can drop it back in and you'll get no color contamination um, but we spotted it and of course it's a real shame uh, with babies and with faces, the light the light source should always be above the nose. I heard this said a few times by different... Uh, I think I was working with Ellie Casti, who's just like one of the best judges to work with. She's lovely, super lovely, super nice person. Um, great newborn photographer. And she raised the same point, as did lots of others. The light source should be above the nose nine times out of ten. It's very rare that you want the light coming up from underneath. Um, I love this quote. This is one of my judges. He just he liked a particular image because it was a bit more different. <laughs> if ever I have another podcast in this industry, I'm going to call it the Bit More Different Podcast because I think it's a great title. It's not English, but it's a great title. Um, final bit on this bit is cropping at the edges. We can't, I kind of talked about it a minute ago with the baby and the objects. Just look around the edges of the frame. There's a, an amazing news image this time around. Loved it. I'm not going to say what it was because I'm I'm not going to uh, draw attention for the author. But there was a scene in the middle. There was action in the middle. And on the right-hand side of the frame, there was nothing contaminating. Everything was kind of contained. But on the left, there were knuckles and elbows poking in onto the edge of the file when just moving the crop edge in by, I don't know, a couple of hundred pixels on a six-megapixel file would have removed all of that and focused directly on the story in the middle and it's such a silly thing we see it all the time is we get sidetracked by what's going on in the middle of our picture the bit we want people to look at and we forget to look all the way around the edges of the frame look around the edges of your frame carefully and if there's anything there that's distracting and pulling your eye away just change your crop or clone them out whichever is easy for you um so that's it. Those are the notes. I mean, there's loads. Of course, there's loads of things. I, I carry copious notes, but I thought those were the most interesting um, to talk about, uh, particularly as we're heading towards the, uh, this time of year when people start to hive images away ready for the competitions uh, for the BIPP print competition. Um, and eventually, you know, the doors will open for the society's convention as well. So I thought they'd be useful. Um, the other thing, a couple of updates. Where are we with things that I've been asked uh, to look at? Uh, where are we? DxO. DxO asked me to play with DxO Labs 
the DxO Labs 4, I think it is, and the DxO Film Pack 7. Now, DxO Labs, it's not really, the Photo Lab, it's not really for me because Lightroom is at the heart of my workflow. Um, we use DxO Pure Raw anyway, which is brilliant. Pure Raw 4, by the way, brilliant. Absolutely love it. Uh, so don't for me that's not necessarily something I'm going to put into my workflow I'm sure it's very good I've used it a little bit but however the DxO film pack film pack 7 it's an absolute blast loving it just for the moment I use effects quite a lot but I like it if I can for it not to look affected if you see what I mean that of course the minute you, the minute you use, apply a film preset of course it looks affected I'm not an idiot um, but I love those kinds of tones they feel very analog to me uh, it's really, uh, really, really, really good. So uh, highly recommend if you get a chance, have a play with that. I'm sure they do a trial. I haven't looked. Uh, DxO uh, Film Pack 7. And the other thing I thought I'd give a quick shout about today um, is ACDC, which I've continued to use. Again, they approached me and asked me to have a look at it and say what I thought. It's really, really good. Um, it's not good at high volumes of face recognition. I discovered that as it, up my, <laughs> it just crashed my computer, basically. Um, but th that notwithstanding, it's blindingly quick. It's great to have it there. Lightroom for us is a management tool for all of our raw files. Files. Um, but the raw files get archived away and we then have all of the JPEGs that I've generated for print, uh, high res and uh, low compression JPEGs. So having ACDC that looks over all of my Dropbox folders and keeps that as an active catalog is great because I can get to any image I like in a heartbeat. Absolutely brilliant. So I absolutely, I would highly recommend that. Um, again, I will put uh, a link to... Um, I'll put a link to ACDC in the show notes. And then finally, just to mop up, it's our beer festival on Saturday. Now, I know none of you are local, but nonetheless, um, I will be at the beer festival. If anyone fancies a beer and a chat, we're in, Bu in Haddenham in Buckinghamshire. Uh, I'd love to catch up if there is anybody around because it's. I'm hoping the weather's going to be good. Um, it's like the best place to listen to music, have a nice beer and have a great conversation. And on that happy note, I'm going to go home now and we're going to open, I hope, a bottle of champagne to celebrate Jake's success and Harriet's success in her new job. Uh, the sun is shining and then we're going to try and stay up and see the results of this particular general election. Again, to all our American friends, have a wonderful uh, July 4th. And I'm going to go away and be more like sitting in a bath of warm water. And remember, whatever else, be kind to yourself. Take care.